Part 1. Part 1. Well, I'm looking for a reasonably priced holiday. I went to South Africa for a month last year, and I'd like to see North America this time, maybe Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, welcome to the Travel Depot. How can I help you? Well, I'm looking for a reasonably priced holiday. I went to South Africa for a month last year and I'd like to see North America this time, maybe Canada. But I'm also interested in Europe if the prices to Canada are too expensive. I'm on quite a tight budget, you see. Well, you could go to Europe, but I'll get some prices for Canada first. I've been to Vancouver. It's lovely at this time of year. And we have some special offers on at the moment. OK, well, I have some relatives over in Vancouver, so that would be good. I can always travel around Europe next year. Besides, it may be a bit too hot for me at this time. Right, let's have a look at some prices then. When would you like to go? Sometime at the end of next month if possible. But I'm quite flexible any time between the 24th and the 31st. I'd like to go for three weeks. Well, there's lots of availability for those dates. Now, if you're concerned about the cost, it's cheaper if you don't mind not flying direct. Sorry? What do you mean? Well, if you don't mind changing planes, then it's cheaper. Oh, well, I don't mind changing planes. In that case, the cheapest flight I have leaves on the 25th and changes in New York. It's only a short stop. You'll be in the airport for two and a half hours. How does that sound? Sounds good, but what's the price? That's £412 for a return flight, but that doesn't include airport tax. Would you like to arrange any accommodation? No, I have a cousin I can stay with. All I need is a flight, so I think I'll take that one. Right, I'll just check availability for your return. Three weeks, did you say? Yes, that's right. OK. Well, there are seats available on the 14th or the 15th. Which one would you prefer? The 14th sounds good. Yes, from the 25th to the 14th sounds fine. I'll reserve that for you then. Can you tell me your name, please? Jim Jackson. Is that J-A-C-K-S-O-N? That's right. And can I take an address and contact number? Yes, it's 10 Allen Road, Oldham. Do you want a home number or my mobile? Either's fine. Well, my home number is 0151 433 398. OK, so you're booked on flight number VN217 to Vancouver, leaving London Heathrow at 11.35 in the morning on the 25th and returning on the 14th. So that's 20 nights. Now, one more thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now one more thing. Do you have any travel insurance? We recommend all our clients take out some kind of cover, even though most people don't end up needing it. Most people have it just for peace of mind. Well, what type of cover do you have? There are two choices, the Gold Star and the Silver Star. Our most comprehensive cover is the Gold Star, which will cost £21 for the period you are away. It's a good policy because it covers almost all eventualities, even extreme sports such as snowboarding and skydiving. Hmm, what about the Silver Star? That's £18, but it doesn't cover you for any dangerous sports. Well, for £3, I think I'll take the first one. The gold cover, please. Right, and is there anything else I can help you with? Well, do you have any information about what to do in Vancouver? Yes, I'm sure there's something on the computer that can help. Ah, uh, yes. There's a Shakespeare play at the theatre, but at $54 it's quite expensive. That starts at 8pm. The City Museum is really popular too, if you like that kind of thing. 
They have a special exhibition of Japanese armour next month. Entrance is free and the museum is open from 9 to 4.30, Monday to Saturday. Would you be interested in either of those? Oh, well, uh, maybe. Well, I'm sure you can arrange that when you get there anyway. So it's the flight and the Gold Star insurance. That's £433 in total. Can I pay by visa? Yes, of course. If you start... That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech given by the head of a company to some new employees. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 11 to 16. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. Barker's was set up ten years ago by myself, John, and my then-girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby, we felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So, five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. 
Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out, and we have all of our ten jeeps and convoy with eight people in each jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So, as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here, so they come back for the bigger tours.、Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8 a.m. and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and then evening ones, 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the family exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually, it is just one jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours, as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal.、Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with a wildlife specialist called Alison Sharp, talking about bears. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the history of the bear. First, look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Now listen to the first part of the interview and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-three. Alison Sharp has spent much of her life researching bears, and in particular, bears in danger of extinction. She is the author of a recent book on bears, and we welcome her to the studio today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. First of all, can you give us a quick overview of the history of the bear family? Well, the bears we know today actually have as their ancestors bears which have been evolving for some forty million years. We have fossils of the earliest true bear. And it's important to emphasize this because some creatures are called bears but are not, such as koalas, for instance. <laughs> yes, exactly. Fossils of the true bear show a small dog-sized animal with characteristics that show a blending of dog and bear traits. So the general belief is that dogs and bears were of the same family. Yes, that's the theory. And then we see the arrival of the early cave bear. 
We know from cave drawings that Neanderthal man used to worship this bear and at the same time fear it. Understandable, perhaps. Uh, yes, but they need not have worried because the cave bear only ate plants. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the cave bear survived two ice ages, but then became extinct. In the second part of the interview, Alison talks more about the situation of bears today. Look at questions 24 to 30 first. Listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. So, how many bears can we find today? And are any of them in danger of extinction? Well, I'll answer your first question first. There are eight species of bear in all, among them the American black bear and the brown bear, from which evolved the newest species of bear, the polar bear. So, how old is the polar bear? Oh, he's a relative newcomer, just 20,000 years old. And could you tell us a little about them? Which is the largest bear, for instance? Well, the largest bear existing today is either the polar bear or the brown bear. Right. Don't we know? <laughs> well, it depends which criteria you use. The polar bear is the heaviest. The male weighs up to 1,500 pounds, but his narrow body actually makes him look smaller than the much more robust brown bear. So the brown bear appears the biggest? Yes. And the smallest? Well, the sun bear is the smallest of the eight species. They only weigh between 60 and 145 pounds. That makes him a comparative junior. <laughs> yes. And then next we have the so-called giant panda. But that's a small bear too, comparatively speaking. And are all bears meat eaters? No, not at all. In fact, the giant panda is almost entirely herbivorous, living on a diet of 30 types of bamboo. Oh, yes, of course. Pandas are famous for that. <laughs> and another interesting bear is the sloth bear, which eats insects, particularly termites. Mm. He can turn his mouth into a tube and suck the insects out of their nests. So, going back to my second question, mm -hmm. are bears really in danger of extinction? Yes, indeed, they are. The sun bear in particular, as they've been hunted almost out of existence. And the habitat of the panda is also being reduced on a daily basis. Can anything be done to reduce the threat to these endangered species? I know, for instance, that it's very hard to breed bears in captivity. Yes. Well... I think that by raising people's awareness generally, we can reduce conflict between humans and animals to stop the slaughter in parts of the world where bears are still hunted, supposedly in self-defense or to protect livestock, but often quite unnecessarily. And we can also encourage governments to preserve the natural environment of the bear rather than allow the areas where they live to be systematically destroyed in the name of progress. Yes, of course. And in addition to these global efforts, all profits from the sale of my book will go toward the United Nations Bear Protection Program. That's wonderful. And with the news coming up, thank you for your time, Alison, and best of luck with the book. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. Now turns to part 4. Part 4. Well, it's the beginning of the digital age. And technology is all set to completely revolutionise the way we watch TV, videos and DVDs and play computer games at home. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, it's the beginning of the digital age. And technology is all set to completely revolutionise the way we watch TV, videos and DVDs and play computer games at home. Here to tell us more about how we will be spending our leisure time at home in future is Anna Zabel. Hello. Yes. There will be huge changes in the way we use television, radio and new media in future. By this I mean we will be able to do what we want, where we want and when we want. The result is that our homes will increasingly become home theatres. And all our entertainment at home will be available at the touch of a button. Now, most home entertainment these days is delivered over wires, but this is changing thanks to high-speed broadband. Downloading will become easier and studios will eventually release movies, songs and video games directly to the consumer. So, for example, instead of a film opening on the big screen and eventually appearing on television, video and the internet, it can appear in all formats at once. This means that we will have more choice and control over the media we use. So, how will we use this media in our homes in future? There will be big changes in how we watch video and television. Several research groups and companies are trying to add depth to TV and other video displays in the form of a third dimension. So television and video screens will have depth. What do you mean by depth exactly? Do you mean 3D, like a hologram? That's right. When we say that a hologram has three dimensions, it means that we can see not only up and down and left and right, but forwards and backwards too. When we talk about dimensions, we call forwards and backwards depth. So when we say that a hologram has three dimensions, it means we can see up and down and left and right, just like a picture or photo. But we can also look into the hologram because the image it contains has depth. So instead of watching films on a flat screen, we will be watching them in 3D? Absolutely. Well, as we live in a 3D world, we shouldn't really be watching television and films in 2D, and the technology to make this happen is already there. 3D screens are being developed which can be placed throughout the house, even in busy areas of our homes, like doorways and halls. Now, these screens appear to float in air, so in the future, 3D holographic images will be sent into our homes and we will be able to experience the action as if it is taking place right in front of our eyes. So, the action won't just look real, it will be real. Incredible! How does this technology work? Well, to get through 3D, each of your eyes has to see a slightly different image. 3D screens interweave multiple images in vertical stripes using special coatings and filters built into the screen. This means that each eye sees a different set of stripes. 
These screens are called lenticular screens. Now, these screens are easy to produce, and some laptop PCs and cell phones already have them. However, lenticular screens do have one disadvantage. The strain on the eyes and brain of putting together a 3D image from two flat ones can result in headaches and dizziness. But a few companies have developed a hologram 3D display which does not cause these problems. Instead of building images, then leaving them to the brain to put together, holograms create a whole image that reaches the eye exactly the way light from a real object does. You can even walk part of the way round a holographic image to see side and back views, just as you would do if the object was right in front of you. Twin holograms will let a couple watch two different programs on the same screen, even if they sit next to each other on the living room sofa. So no more arguing about which program to watch. That's right. Patio screens are being developed too. Patio screens? What are they exactly? Well, a patio screen is a big inflatable screen, which means you can take it outside your home and watch a film in your garden. Some patio screens are even equipped with DVD players, and some new ones may even have a wireless connection. Amazing developments there. Well, join us after the break when we will be talking. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.